Thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. Good morning, afternoon, evening, depending where you are. And um, I'm delighted to be here today with you. Um, I'm, I'm Marcos Valderrabano, work as a uh, program manager for Red List of Ecosystems in IUCN headquarters in Switzerland. And um, what I'm going to start is a presentation by a quick overview of where we are with the Red List of Ecosystems uh, around the world, which has been uh, suffering a considerable development in the last 10 years. And, uh, and now it's being applied in more than 100 countries and more than 3,000 ecosystems, terrestrial, marine, and freshwater across the planet, as you can see in this map. And when we were looking in detail about what was going on on Red List of Ecosystems in the world and what was being used for, we realized there were very, very interesting examples across the planet um, where the results of the Red List of Ecosystems were informing restoration actions on the ground. And some of the examples here on the figure you can see on the left-hand side, the case of the Red List of Ecosystems of Colombia that was used to propose some restoration priorities in remote areas by crossing that information with unproductive and livestock areas and allow to conduct a, a proposal for a national-wide planning on priorities. Or, for example, in the case of Mountain Ash uh, National Park in Australia, the Red List of Ecosystem there allowed to inform the specific forestry practices and modify how the forestry practices were being conducted there to reduce the risk they were affecting in the ecosystem. So we realized that and there were several examples across the world that were very, very interesting, but they were kind of appearing in an spontaneous way without really learning from each other and getting that organized in a systematic way. And within that context, we reach now the moment with the, the launching of the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration and all the momentum that is generating that we've been following up very much through this forum. And we realized it might be very, very interesting to contribute and somehow organize all this knowledge within in some kind of a systematic way. Um, and try to answer some of the questions that, that were floating on the air, some of which were uh, partly answered by the red list of ecosystem itself, like where the degradation is going to leave the ecosystem to the edge of collapse, or how can we assess um, what is the risk of those ecosystems to collapse. But some others are more about how do we apply them specifically for our restoration uh, work. And so how can we use this information to help planning on the ground? Or are the concrete restoration actions actually reducing the risk of the system to be collapsed. So there were a number of questions that we intended to, to, to answer. And um, that, that led that for the last year or so, there's been a, a group of a fascinating group of authors gathering together, trying to compile all these and answer those questions into this publication using ecosystem risk assessment science for ecosystem restoration. So um, I'm going to be presenting me and Andres and then uh, James Hallett in the name of all the other authors that have been preparing this publication and that will be hopefully available in the next two or three weeks. Um, so I will, the intention of, of this collection of information was first try to provide an overview of what is the Red List of Ecosystems, that is exactly what I will be talking for the next five or 10 minutes. Then what, of the, what information of contained within the Red List of Ecosystem Assessment can be used for ecosystem restoration? How then this can inform planning and application on the ground of restoration programs? And then at the end, how this information can inform the monitoring process so that we learn what is the impact of our restoration programs and whether they are reducing the risk of collapse. And all these other questions will be led by Andres Hetter and Jim Hallett uh, immediately after. So what I will do first is briefly um, introduce what is the Red List of Ecosystems, which is a global standard for assessing the ecosystem risk of collapse. Let me stop for a few minutes in what do we 
what do we mean by ecosystems? What do we mean by risk? And what do we mean by collapse? So ecosystems in the sense of the red, ecosystems are always very complex, have been interpreted in a very different way, but, but many different people. And they are not the same thing for a landscape ecologist than um, for a microbiologist. So the interpretation that we did for the red list of ecosystem and the scientists behind the development of this methodology was to adopt a very broad uh, definition by Tansley, um, where are complex of organisms and there are shaped physical environment within an area, which it means that we are talking about a specific area that is mappable that we can design in a map with its own boundaries, that it's composed of living organisms, meaning plants and animals and fungi, um, within a specific abiotic environment with its own conditions and a number of interactions between the biota and the abiotic elements. And this seems to maybe an obvious element for, for most of you, which are probably more interested in restoration and actions on the ground, but might not be the same case for a, a phytosociologist or someone um, more interested in designing, for example, potential maps of ecosystems. So it was very needed at the beginning to clearly define what ecosystems are in this context. Now, recently, the new development of the IUCN Global Ecosystem Typology that has been um, launched along this year proposed a very clear framework of how to define the ecosystems within um, a specific hierarchical view. Um, I invite, uh, if any of you is interested, to visit the, um, the website globalecosystems.org or search for the publication IUCN Global Ecosystem Typology, where uh, you can have a description of the hierarchical structure of the ecosystem distribution, which provides kind of a, a, an interesting framework also for learning across um, ecosystem restoration initiatives on the ground. So whenever you're talking about a rainforest, you, you mean rainforest, the same thing in Congo, than in Brazil, for example. And that's gonna provide interesting applications, not only for the red list of ecosystems, but also to enabling uh, a common language across um, ecosystem projects on the ground. So um, the second element of the definition, so if, if the red list of ecosystem assesses the ecosystem risk of collapse, risk is the probability of an adverse outcome over a specific time frame, which might be obvious. But um, it's important to highlight, similarly to the red list of species, that um, it's not the same thing risk and priority. So if risk assess the probability of an adverse outcome. Um, and it's a scientific uh, exercise that gathers the element, assess the trends, uh, and then ends up with a probability of achieving that bad outcome. Now, the priority is rather a socioeconomic or a negotiation process where you decide where you're gonna use your resources for. Um, and it's where decisions are taken. Now, the risk of collapse can inform the priority, but the priority setting is done, is done later, of course. And it will be taken due to other factors like the probability of success or the cost. Um, or the societal preferences. Now, um, if we assess the ecosystem risk of collapse, um, which is the analogous for ecosystems as extinction is for species. Now, species go extinct are relatively easy to assess. Well, maybe not so easy for certain vegetables, for example, and plants where um, and it, well, it, it's relatively easy to assess, uh, but collapse uh, provides some challenges to be defined because it implies transformation of identity and a replacement by a new system. So how to assess collapse? Um, it, and, and here is where the probability for assessing collapse brings in um, a number of risk categories that mirror the very well-known categories for the red list of species that go from least concern, vulnerable, endangered, critically endangered, and then at the very end, collapse. In order to assign this risk, growing risk category for a certain ecosystem, 
what the methodology provides is a standard um, generic mechanism that follow a similar pathways for collapse. And those are grouped into two main uh, types of pathways or mechanisms of collapse. Uh, first one are spatial processes, which is basically the disappearance of the ecosystem. It could be uh, forest cut or uh, coral dieback or you name it, but the ecosystem is it's lost in a particular area and replaced by something else. And the second degradation process are more the degradation as we understand it, where either the biotic components or the, the either the biotic relations or the abiotic components get degraded slowly, slowly. And those are integrated into the criteria that assess the risk within the red list of ecosystems. Um, in this particular case, um, <clears throat> in, in Mongolia, um, the um, this area was going to be inundated and flooded with the construction of a new dam. So the spatial symptoms were taken into consideration when assessing this ecosystem, not only, only assessing the past trends, but also the future projections. So in both cases, the spatial uh, elements and biotic biotic degradation consider the recent past and trends, but also the future projection for the sufficient information to um, confirm it. Abiotic degradation may include the degradation of the abiotic processes, uh, sediment, nitrogen, um, salinity, um, humidity, precipitation, temperature, or the biotic components and interactions. It could be, for example, like the presence of uh, invasive species that are replacing the native biota by a completely new species composition, for example. And what is more interesting is that through the process of red list of ecosystem, usually there is um, a group of experts and stakeholders involved in the assessment, and they are um, together trying to simplify and express in a simplified way how the ecosystem interactions function. Um, the picture here um, on the right hand side, it's um, a real example of a coral reef conceptual model that were uh, specialists for, from um, East Africa were asked to develop, to um, express how the coral reef function. It took a, a considerable amount of time and discussion to simplify it as the model on the, on the left, where we could simplify the relations among the biotic elements and the pressures and threats in a, in a way that could be um, usable and uh, develop uh, models. But, but the exercise in itself, so rather than the results, the process to reach these common consensus on how does it work, where are the limits, is where it's especially interesting. And at the end, uh, all these criteria, the, the green one are the spatial criteria, the kind of distribution or restricted distribution, and um, the functionals are the blue ones, and then there is a fifth one, which is a qualitative risk analysis. All these pathways are grouped into five criteria that are um, used to analyze what is the ecosystem risk of collapse and their specific thresholds and, and timeframes and the result of the exercise is um, the representation of the ecosystem within these categories that provide the results of the risk of collapse into a growing um, pattern uh, as we previously saw. And uh, I would like to thank, uh, I don't want to finish without thanking um, all the very many contributions that we've received from um, several partners and contributors around the world. And I would like to invite you, if you would like to know more about Red List of Ecosystems, there is the, this webpage, iucnle.org. Um, have a look, I invite you to look or write to me an email if you want further information. Um, thank you very much. And over to you, 
undress. Hello, everybody who joined this webinar. I am Andres Hetter, based at Javeriana University in Bogota, Colombia. Uh, I'm uh, going to try to show you with this talk, uh, I hope, why the Red List of Ecosystem is a very useful resource to guide our strategic risk restoration. Um, just to say this part of this um, book has also had a lot of contributions as by the co-authors, Hallett, James, Jen McGreen, Cara, and Emily Bott. So first of all, I will briefly present the use of the Red List of Ecosystems, um, how the data and outputs set general priorities of where to restore ecosystems at risk. Also, I would like to introduce how we can set targets to downlist an ecosystem at risk using the Red List of Ecosystems. And just to say that the talk is mainly illustrated by using examples of the Red List of Ecosystems, which have been leading for the last uh, several years. Um, so what, what the Red List of Ecosystems brings to restoration planning? Uh, initially, what it brings is that we can identify the risk of collapse category of each ecosystem, and also to understand the underlying diagnostic causes of risk. It also helps us showing the portion of an at-risk ecosystem that has been lost or extirpated, or also where the remnants have lost their integrity through degradation. So that's essentially uh, then that the red list can help us uh, restoring lost and extirpated ecosystems. So bring it back from uh, um, the absence of the ecosystems up to the hopefully intact ecosystem. And the second important application is that we can go to degraded or remnant ecosystems and uh, try to find uh, which threats and uh, processes we need to restore in order for the ecosystem to regain its integrity. At the same time, uh, the Red List with all this information can contribute to identify priority areas to focus restoration, increasing, in, in, aimed at increasing ecosystem area, of course, and integrity then. Um, so just to, to walk a little bit through the criteria that Marcos introduced very well uh, and how it, it links with these two aspects I just mentioned. Um, sorry. Just... So a first aspect is and then how much and where to restore a lost or extirpated ecosystem. And for this, the criteria A and B that showed the Marcos, a criterion A shows us where the distribution of an ecosystem has been lost, while criterion B helps us to, to understand and find important areas where locations of the ecosystem have been lost. In a, a second aspect is uh, what to restore in degraded remnants and lost extirpated ecosystems. So then we can also use the criteria C and D, which inform us about where to restore what abiotic processes that have been degraded, or where to restore and what biotic components and processes which have been degraded as well. At the same time, the red list also has a wealth of information about characterizing the, um, the threats and so we can understand where to reduce or abate threats to restore these degraded remnants and lost or extirpated ecosystems. So these are the basically the, the link between the, the evaluation of risk evaluation of the red list of ecosystems and how we can then inform these two avenues to ecosystem restoration 
lost and extirpated ecosystems and degraded ecosystems in remnants. Here, yeah, just want to go through quickly through the Colombian example, where we show how first what we had to do was to rebuild an original Colombian uh, terrestrial ecosystem model based on all kinds of abiotic and biotic uh, information and of course landscape and spatial information. And then at the same time, we, we needed to, to understand a little bit how the ecosystem has been cleared and degraded. We built a 50 year multi temporal transformation model of the country using several remote sensing, historical data, and well, all kinds of information that provided inputs to, to this. And at the end, um, have the current state of the Colombian ecosystems, which allows us then to navigate through this. Uh, criteria set by the relatives of ecosystems to understand the, where ecosystems have been lost, the, at what pace they have been lost, etc. At the same time, we had to build, of course, to understand the risks. We need to characterize the threats. So in the rows, you find a number of threats we have been uh, characterizing for the country, going from fossil fuel extraction to agriculture, to mining, to um, soil degradation or ener energy infrastructure. And on the columns, we'll have all the 81 ecosystems that were mapped for Colombia and characterized for each one of them, then the intensity of the risks, the, the threats posed with all these uh, activities which is an, an important uh, input um, to re, uh, threat abandonment. The result of, of a red list of ecosystems is then a map showing the current ecosystems and their risk status. Red for cri critical, uh, orange for endangered, uh, yellow for vulnerable, and green for least concern in this case. In this case. And then of course we have the cleared or lost ecosystems um, too. At the same time, having at hand the potential ecosystem map, we can also then look into the cleared areas where the current critical ecosystems used to be, or vulnerable or endangered ecosystems used to be uh, formerly, and then to understand in which areas we can go and increase or try to increase again the area of uh, these ecosystems. Just going through a, a quick example of one specific uh, ecosystem, which is a, a forest in the eastern plains of Colombia, which are very important in terms of their endemics and uh, the restricted distribution. It also follows and in, flows into, into Venezuela. So in this case, what we have uh, is the original distribution of this ecosystem. And at the same time, we have the areas where uh, we can see the remnants and the, the cleared ecosystem areas. So in the remnants, we would think that we can go and um, restore ecosystem integrity of these remnants, while in the cleared or lost areas of ecosystems, we can go and um have a restoration to increase their area but then of course um besides this risk assessment we also need to consider other types of information to really set priorities the in the sense marcos mentioned before uh and to we need to include some additional data, uh, like for instance, uh, try to understand where the land use conflicts are lowest, trying to, to, to figure out uh, uh, information about the productivity of the land. Uh, we would like, of course, also, if we want uh, to, the restoration to proceed uh, in, a, in a good pace, that the degradation of soils is as low as possible 
probably also would like to have uh, a proximity to natural areas so that's that we have like the, the accessibility to propagos uh, near water corridors and of course very importantly also the low cost of land and all this we could in principle integrate through multi-criteria analysis as we did in the in an example an application we did for for colombia now going to the target setting for restoration we need then basically to to downlist an ecosystem from critical to endangered or vulnerable or, or least concern we really need to first uh, reduce and abate the threats on one side and on the other side we would need to really increase the integrity of the ecosystem and increase the ecosystem area uh, and that would be like the, the the path we would need to but this we can do also with an example this example i showed you just briefly which is uh, currently we have only less than 19 percent uh, just over 19 percent of the of the area remaining so if we would like to regain uh, an endangered uh, uh, risk level or a vulnerable risk level we need to increase progressively a number of hectares of this ecosystem so for instance to get to the vulnerable state we would need to restore at least 431,000 hectares in this case um, and then the path of restoration of course then we can not only think in terms of area but we would need to to think uh, at the time frames we need to attain uh, area and integrity of an ecosystem as shown in this briefly in this um, in this example here in this uh, diagram um, often then this to construct these pathways we can uh, use predictive modeling modeling based on the function of the ecosystem that can also account for nonlinear behaviors of recovery to establish uh, like more realistic time frames and set some some kind of, of expectations of the of the recovery of the targets of the ecosystem um well this is basically what i had to to offer today uh, thank you very much and uh, i will give the word to jim the third component of our um, session today is um, really to consider some of the elements of um, actual application of the red list of ecosystems in restoration practice and um, as in other talks um, the contributions of several people um, uh, are included within this including work um, by kara nelson and josie carward and csiro so the first um, point um, i want to consider is that overall planning for restoration is uh, hierarchical in other words um, we're um, really thinking about um, the broader landscapes and seascapes uh, for um, our broader planning and prioritization and then within these landscapes and seascapes we're uh, defining um, issues at the ecosystem level uh, for better understanding and for setting targets as Andres just explained. But our final application then of course is at the site scale um, where the actual implementation is going to take place. I'll be slightly redundant with um, Andres here in that um, as he mentioned uh, with the example for Columbia that uh, we can think about both um, restoration of lost um, uh, or degraded ecosystems and areas that are are lost of course then require increase in overall areas shown for the, the yellow cleared areas and areas that um, are remnants require restoration to increase um, in ecosystem integrity um, and he discuss the, the general process for um, examining um, 
both the, the information from the RLE, but other data as well. And these include um, the current land uses, cost of the land, um, uh, the degree of degradation of the, the biophysical um, conditions, the actual capacity for achieving different levels of restoration, uh, the distance to other remnants or to natural or protected areas, and then, of course, the availability of funding and what the anticipated costs uh, will be for the work. And this is where um, RLE and this additional information comes into the multi criteria decision making process. And so, initially, we, um, of course, on the, excuse me, on the, the left side of uh, the chart here. Um, we're uh, setting our, our perspective in defining the, the uh, uh, problem we're, we're attempting to solve. And at this point, we need to be sure that stakeholders that are um, directly or indirectly uh, affected by uh, our restoration work have a seat at the table for both the analysis and, and to be engaged in the process. And then we uh, go through development of the project, what our alternatives might be in, in um, restoring the system to then how we're going to assess the work um, of our project, where we define the criteria, we weight the criteria, again, based on uh, the needs and, and responses of stakeholders uh, to where we finally have a prioritization of the alternatives um, for the work to be conducted. And then the project implementation, um, including the site assessment, and then um, uh, I, I say passive active restoration, but the approaches to implementing um, the work on the ground. And so again, it's a hierarchical um, uh, fashion, but we're ultimately working um, to uh, perform implementation at at sites and hopefully uh, ultimately scale up from single sites to a broader region. So clearly restoration uh, implementation is a, a process that takes a number of steps. Um, the initial one uh, here at the, the top of the screen is, oops, excuse me, is problem identification where we can um, evaluate uh, work from the red list of ecosystems and the uh, possibility of ecosystem risk of collapse are to uh, of setting the targets for our uh, work. And these, again, can be the area targets um, for areas that have been lost, um, how we go about threat abatement, and then integrity targets for um, areas that are in a remnant uh, status onto our actual planning um, using, again, the risk assessment information and other types of data and having a participatory planning process where we can evaluate alternative options for uh, work onto the actual implementation, what we do at the site level, and then followed by monitoring uh, both for uh, analysis of the baseline conditions and what our short and long-term impacts might be. And then to uh, learn from uh, the work we've conducted on the ground. And so all of these things, um, uh, particularly the monitoring, feed into our ability to adaptively manage our, our project. That is to take information about what has occurred on the ground as a result of our management activities and feed that back through so that if our, we made errors in our, our problem identification or setting targets or um, how we've gone about planning and implementing the work um, can be adjusted uh, to uh, achieve the uh, objectives that we want. So our last chapter of our book um, really deals with this issue of monitoring uh, the effects of our Restor restorative um, activities or interventions 
on ecosystem area, on integrity of the ecosystem, and the risk of collapse. Um, and one of the, the major points of this um, uh, chapter is that effective monitoring requires really more than just a plan for data collection. So if we start, start at the top of our circle here with our uh, specific objectives, our objectives then lead to our questions about for monitoring. And once we have developed those questions to assess um, our objectives, we can uh, begin the data collection process. And then of course we need uh, a structure for data management and ultimately data analysis and interpretation. And then the ability to transfer the information that we get uh, to others and uh, for the adaptive management of the project um, on up to assessment of our actual monitoring program, because maybe our, our monitoring program uh, has been flawed. So all of these components then um, uh, come into uh, prominence in, in developing an effective monitoring program. And additionally, uh, we need to be thinking about how we're going to um, address the, the question of evaluating our work from the onset of the, of the project. So when we're setting our uh, restoration um, objectives. Um, initially, we should start thinking about how we're going to go about uh, evaluating um, our work. So there's um, at least three types of uh, monitoring um, that we can consider. The, the first is implementation monitoring, which simply asks to what extent are the activities uh, uh, implemented as we had originally um, uh, uh, plan to, to do. And so implementation monitoring is often important for funders. They want to know if the, the money they spent on a project is actually going into uh, work on the ground. Um, and uh, it allows, at the same time, we uh, need to have the ability to um, understand and, and, and um, write down the, the types of activities that uh, have occurred. So as we get further and further into a project, um, unless this is um, recorded, um, there's less and less understanding of, of what actually might have happened. Uh, the second uh, form of monitoring is efficacy and, and simply asks to what extent is our um, post-active activity area or integrity, does it match a reference um, condition? Uh, and so we are asking, is the result of our restoration uh, actions, is it uh, getting us closer to our objectives, uh, which can be a, a, a reference state uh, defined at a project outset? Um, uh, versus um, effects monitoring, which actually asks, um, does our, are the changes that occur in the, the, the project site or program area, are they a result of actual restoration work? So in other words, are changes due just to temporal changes and shifts in um, distributions or is it due to the work that we've um, actually conducted? And in order to do this, to measure really the impact of our restoration activity, we have to uh, have areas that have not uh, been uh, subject to restoration. So in other words, a type of control area to evaluate the, the change um, or the magnitude of the effects um, of the restoration work. So going back to the uh, red list of ecosystem indicators, we can uh, monitor changes that take place uh, using um, the recovery wheel, which um, was first um, promoted in the Australian um, 
uh, standards for ecological restoration and uh, promoted also in the SER um, international standards. Um, and here we have the wheel divided up into the two criteria C, which is the abiotic uh, environment and criterion D, which is uh, the biotic environment, including composition, structure, and function. And so we can evaluate changes um, in uh, these um, criteria um, over time to see where um, we're actually having an effect and where we may need to actually um, modify or um, uh, attempt to uh, uh, improve uh, uh, conditions for that uh, particular criteria. And finally, um, as part of monitoring, we want to ensure that um, the things that we learn from the work that we conduct on the ground. So in other words, uh, once we've monitored and assessed, uh, we can learn both from failure and success in uh, implementation. It's good to share those um, understandings to the broader community. And there are a number of um, uh, possibilities for uh, doing so, uh, depending on the particular focus of uh, the work. So for example, the Restoration Resource Center developed by the Society for Ecological Restoration has a specific focus on ecological restoration and um, allows submission of information uh, for all types of locations and ecosystems, um, and both in terms of project design and outcomes. It's a global database on sustainable land management um, uh, through um, WOCAT, uh, the Panorama Solutions for a Healthy Planet, is a collaborative um, issue for looking at successful practices um, uh, around the globe. Um, and then Restore, uh, relatively recent um, platform developed by the Restore Foundation, uh, attempting to make information from a wide variety of sources, including satellite uh, imagery data, field data available to uh, practitioners and uh, conservation. Uh, uh, experts. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll close and, and say thank you. And I hope that um, when uh, this publication is available, that you'll uh, take a look at it and provide feedback to um, all the authors. Um, we really enjoy um, hearing from you. And thank you. Thanks so much to all of our speakers, Marcus, Andres, and Jim. We have just under 15 minutes for questions. Thanks to those of you who have posted questions. If you haven't had a chance to do so, go ahead and type your questions into the Q&A window, not into the chat, because we won't be monitoring the chat for uh, questions to the speakers. Um, I also want to advertise before we start the Q&A next month's webinar, we have Pamela McElwee, uh, who will be discussing ensuring cultural practices are included in restoration agendas. Okay, we've got several questions that have come in concerning the concept of ecosystem integrity. And um, for the first one from Brian, I'll ask uh, Marcos to cover. And uh, he asked, please explain ecosystem integrity in the context of a degraded or collapsed ecosystem. Okay, um, thank you for the question. So ecosystem integrity is usually assessed based on composition, structure, and function, and that's how we usually see it defined. In the context of assessing how close it is to collapse states, or what is the risk of collapse for the red list of ecosystems, we usually assess the symptoms or the, the pathways, and we usually assess separately what is the 
uh, the abiotic elements and what indicators we can identify within the abiotic elements that compose the ecosystem separate from what are the biotic composition and the relation between the biota separately. So even if the elements are composition, structure, and function, and we usually learn in the books, the way how we look at them and assess them in the terms of, um, of the collapse state are looking at those separately, abiotic and biotic interactions. I don't know if Andres want to complement that one or that's... Andres, I'll say that there was a specific question for you on this topic. What do you mean with uh, increasing or restoring the integrity of an ecosystem? And then I can make a few comments at the end as well. Okay, so uh, increasing the integrity means that uh, the, the, the ecosystem remnants at a certain moment of time can have different um, a loss of different of its functions and components due to the threats and human activities or into the future with climate change. So the idea is that um, uh, regaining integrity would mean that we would restore the composition toward this desired or, or uh, reference state as well as the functions and in this case, for instance, one possibility is to, by reintroducing certain species, we can uh, regain certain processes such as uh, seed dispersal or pollination or uh, well, many others. Um, so this, this would be in principle what I would have to say, I know if, if this is clear enough. Yeah, thank you, Andres. And I'll just add, because there was another question about this, concerning the RLE and risk of collapse. The factors include ecosystem integrity, which is the inverse of ecosystem degradation and does include composition, structure, and function. And it also includes, so this risk of collapse threat assessment. So there's those two things. The uh, state of the ecosystem with respect to degradation of composition, structure, function, and uh, threats to the ecosystem. So, so hopefully that clarified, and thank you to those of you who asked those clarifying questions. Um, let's see, um, there was a question about whether the assessment of ecosystem risk also can be used to estimate implementation costs of restoration or capacity for natural regeneration. And Andres, I thought you might want to comment on that, um, given those in the model. Yeah, can you can you just briefly repeat the kind of I, I, Yeah, I, sure. My, my, yeah. my audio is. Okay, here we go. Can the assessment of ecosystem risk also be used to estimate Two things, one, implementation costs of restoration and capacity for natural regeneration. Well, um, the costs, uh, probably the, the we, we assume that the more uh, at risk an ecosystem is, the more time and cost it is to regain a reference state, I would say. Uh, how far the risk assessment can inform really the costs? Uh, I maybe we uh, modeling the time of, of recovery and the resources needed. Maybe a way to do that to to, to but um, to inform that. But I wouldn't really know at this moment exactly how to uh, what else to say. But. Uh, in terms of, of, of uh, regeneration, uh, of course, to, to regenerate an area that has been cleared, uh, uh, certain conditions have to be met that facilitate this regeneration. So, and that's why we, we use, in, in the case I presented, a certain amount of, of, of criteria that we can use within a multi-criteria analysis 
to show which areas are more likely that this regeneration will occur in at the at the highest speed if we want and at the lower cost so for instance uh, if if we find areas that have a very degraded soils or are very far from areas that can provide propagules for instance of course uh, uh, it is less likely that the regeneration will will proceed so that's why um, the, the the logic way of doing that is uh, by identifying the, uh, the target ecosystem at the same time we need to find areas that where, where certain factors uh, uh, coincide, such as as uh, close to natural areas and uh, uh, low degradation, high water availability, and lower threats uh, to that uh, regeneration process. Was that uh, clear? Or? Yes. Thank you, Andres. Jim, I am wondering if you can answer a question about how we differentiate restoration from rehabilitation when speaking to non-scientists or administrators. <laughs> this, this actually um, was a question that came up at the, the World Conservation Congress when I uh, talked about this with Marcos. Um, and so it's a definitional issue and it, um, Usually, it has to do with um, uh, what the initial uh, uh, threat factors were to um, areas on the ground. So, typically for rehabilitation, it's where there has been a, uh, a major uh, uh, mining or some other type of um, uh, activity that has uh, moved the state of the system uh, quite far away. Um, and so rehabilitation often um, has legal components that, that drive it um, versus our, the, act, the broader activity of, of um, uh, restoration, uh, which seeks to um, uh, improve the, the structure, the function and composition of um, our ecological systems. Great, thanks, Jim. We have a couple minutes left. We'll take a few more questions. There have been a few questions that have come in concerning are the videos available? Is the book available? I've provided links to the uh, videos when they're posted on YouTube and on the IUCN CEM webpage in the chat. Uh, I think I've posted them twice now. So scroll up or if if you can't see them, go ahead and send me a message and I'll send them direct to you. The book is in the final stages of production. And when it's available, we'll send a follow-up email to all participants in the session. So you'll get a link to download it if that's of interest. And Jim, I'll turn it over to you for our last few minutes for some uh, comments on remaining questions. Um, so we do have um, Robin uh, Chasden had several questions about monitoring um, and the fact that I didn't talk about criteria uh, that included socioeconomic factors. And thank you for that, Robin. Uh, but within the, the planning process um, uh, during uh, stakeholder engagement, I did mention that that's when um, uh, criteria can be developed. And so I wasn't meaning to um, downplay uh, social effects at all, but uh, more turn the focus to the ecological effects that were associated with uh, the red list of ecosystems. And so, you know, certainly um, uh, these um, uh, factors are important and would be included in a, in a, in a typical restoration project. Um, and you also asked whether uh, we should be monitoring the threats. Um, and uh, of course, uh, that would also be um, taken within the, the uh, planning uh, stage for, for monitoring. I think you might have had another question that was along the same lines. 
No. So I hope that helps, yeah. Ron. Yeah, thanks for that. It's interesting because in the context of the guide, we're focusing specifically on the use of the red list of ecosystems, which evaluates ecological integrity and threats and risk of collapse. And so the monitoring section, you have a caveat in the introduction of that section saying just exactly what Jim said, that of course, monitoring towards social goals is critical in restoration in the context of monitoring the risk of collapse, we're looking at ecological integrity and threats as our key indicator variables. Um, let's see, we have two more minutes left and so many great questions. Um, let me take a second and ask this one. This is a tough one. Uh, are you satisfied that the approach is sufficiently focused on services from the restored ecosystems and their contributions to people. And I'm ending on that question because there were quite a few questions that came in asking about social dimensions, um, social impacts, and also human population as the elephant in the room. So anyone want the last word? on how we're doing with this approach and others in terms of uh, the human dimensions and the services that people need. I, I believe in the, in the book, we have addressed that in the decision-making process later down the road, how do you do with information? But it doesn't um, account in the part of the red list of ecosystem itself. So whether, um, the value of the ecosystem is being used, whether there is human populations there giving ecosystem services to the ecosystem there, where um, it's irrelevant in the diagnosis process. It is extremely relevant in the decision-making process later down the road. And that's why we've tried to divide that process. First, you collect the information, what are the bottlenecks, where, where are the threats, why your ecosystem is degraded and to what extent, and what of those factors are clearly affecting more the ecosystem and its capacity to adapt. And then you go into the decision. Then you may decide not to do anything or, or to do something about it. And then you value whether that ecosystem provides more services, whether the cost of restoration are higher, um, whether you can uh, actually make a difference in the existing threats and so on. But I think that the extinction facilitate the process. And um, yeah, that's my hey. opinion. Jim or Andres, if you think differently about it. Well, thanks so much, Marcos. And I'm going to call it here because we are right on the hour and give a big thank you to all of you for your presentations, all of our participants. We had individuals, experts, students from all continents participating, and I hope many of you will join us to, for the discussion on cultural practices. That's the third Friday in October, October 15th at the same time. Thanks to everyone, have a great month, and uh, engage in the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. Thank you for organizing. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kara, for organizing. Very nice. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.